70, 71, and... Uh, You're not going to go through every year, dear, are you? No, 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 I'm not. Doomsday. No, no. Um, <laughs> 70, 71, of where you come down as a three-piece group. Yeah. Um, which was a resounding success. I was very anti-guitar. I didn't want a guitar in the band at all. Mm. Uh, until we'd played ourselves out, more or less, by the... I mean, as I say, we didn't, they didn't play on the record, the band, but by the mm. time Madman Across the Water came out and we played it on stage, it was time for change and time to add something. I mean, Davey came in for Honky Shatter, mm. who'd never played an electric guitar in his life. He played in a folk group called Magna Carta. And the first guitar he ever played was on Ballad of a Well-Known Gun. Mm. Uh, no, Susie Dramas on the Honky Shatter album. And, the other two were quite a bit resentful in the, uh, to start with, but it had, you know, we'd gone as far as we could as a three-piece. So how important then was the producer for you? Oh, uh, in incredibly important. I mean, I did 17 albums with Gus straight off, and it's, you need, I mean, I really needed a producer, and he used to criticise my songs, and uh, it's so helpful, you know. You can't, I often think there's a lot of major acts, so I won't name, that don't take any notice of anybody, um, they have producers, but I know for a fact they just won't listen. And the music is affected by it. I think they become stale. You have to have someone there that can see. You get so close to a song sometimes, you can't see the wood for the trees. And not only with Gus, but Chris Thomas was great like that as well. Mm. I've always had people, you know, producers that you have to. There's no point in hiring a producer. If you're going to do it yourself, I did a couple of albums with Clive Franks. It was fun. But I actually, I really enjoy having a producer. OK, I mean, like... When it comes to sort of like the second album and the third album... She's gone... I'm at May 28, dear. Don't you No, no. <laughs> it's unbelievable. How long is it? What's this for, dear? And are uh, you... I'm ignoring all of that. Uh, where you uh, went into sort of like heavy arrangements as well. Yeah. Which was unusual at that time as well. Heavy arrangements? Well, well back, with Backmaster and Well, that was like, from the Elton John album. I yeah. mean, that started... I mean, that revolutionised string sort of writing in rock and roll. Mm. And it sort of ended with a Man, Man Across the Water album. That's when Buckmaster fell apart, and that's when I needed to sort of change the band and add a guitar and become more of a sort of an independent band. And then the band played on the records. On Honky Chateau was the first time that my band in full played on a record. OK, so uh, you, you, you've toured through the 70... 172 <laughs> period. I mean, well, I mean, this is what I must do it. I mean, this is the only way I know how to do it. Another 13 years to go. <laughs> no, you haven't. <laughs> Just... 13 years. <laughs> God. Well, you have been around for a long time. I know. <laughs> that was herpes, but we don't have to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're up to, you're up to the <laughs> Nongi Chateau album. I know exactly where you're right, up. Right, Nongi Chateau. No, 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 no. Yeah, Mad right. Men Across the Water. Well, we've gone back one. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I thought we were wrong. Yeah, Bad Man Across the Water, yes, yes. Right. Bad Man Across the Water, be sensible. Um, though, I mean, there's some classic tracks off, off that as well. I don't like well. that album very much. You don't like that album. I, but that's the one album... Well, Tiny it, Dance will leave on, I think. That, there's um, some nice songs, I'm just happy, unhappy with my vocal. Uh, it was a kind of... There are a few things happening in the studio. Paul Buckmaster was falling apart. He used, and it was kind of rushed, that album. And there's some nice songs on it. And funnily enough, 80 or 90% of the people that come up to me, that's their favourite album. Um, I think I, it's a great album. Well... I, I cringe when I hear it. I'm talking about my actual vocal performances on it. And they were, it was rushed, we were touring, and it was, it was, you know, we used to produce an album in two weeks in those days. Mm -hmm. I mean, we used to do two a year. Is yeah. there something wrong with that, though? No, there's nothing wrong with that at all. It's just I wish I could have done, I feel like I could have done them better. And yet, you know, a, a lot of people really like it. Well, I mean, if you had done it better, may, may it not have been too clinical then? No, I just, no. I, no I'm just talking about my actual pitching. Right. I'm not talking right. about the quality of my voice, I'm talking about the actual, there's a pitching on that album that I don't like. And, and uh, the actual circumstances when it was recorded were, to say the least, fraught. Like this interview will be if you don't get on to the next right. album. Honky Shadow. Um, <laughs> I was about to get into it. <laughs> Honky Shadow took you in an, a new direction around the world. Yes. Yeah, well, it was the first album I ever recorded abroad, for example, and... You know, it was so lovely to record in France, you say, because the French hated me. Um, no, it was the first album I recorded with the band, basically. I, for, for, like, three albums, Gus had held out about having, not having Nigel and Dion on the albums, and then suddenly there was the four of us on an album, and it was so enjoyable. And we were, the first time we'd recorded where we actually wrote I would write and they'd be sort of like playing and it was like an instant hit factory. Bernie would be writing the lyrics, Maxine would be typing them. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, at, at, but, but by the time Honky Shadow was happening, um, you were becoming a major name around the world and you were becoming a, f a performer and you also had an image. So how are you coping with all of that? And okay. how did you approach that image. I didn't even think about it. I didn't think about the image which everybody criticised me for, like 
the, the clothes, you know, they said you didn't need to wear the clothes because the music is good. Um, but I was just living my teenage years during my 20s, you know, I didn't have much fun in my teenage years and I, first time I'd had a chance to express myself, and boy, did I, you know? And, and I just, it's great fun, you know? I just, I thought the music stood up for itself and I was just, for the first time in my life, I was being able to wear high heel shoes and dresses and stand on top of the pianos and, you know, do things like that. I mean, when you look at my costumes, I got away with murder, but I had a ball. I've taken a lot of risks in my career that people probably haven't given me credit for. I've, you know, established, when I put out singles, you could only put out three minute singles over here, like in the mm. early 70s, and we put out, God knows how many, five minute singles put out the first three-track uh, single in America, which the record company said, oh, don't tell any of our other artists about. And that was Saturday nights, all right for fighting you know, Jack Rabbit, and whenever you're ready, we'll go steady again. And MCA said, oh, if you tell anybody like Neil Diamond, because I had to pay an extra penny or something, if you've got another track, they have to pay another penny royalty. Well. The mind boggles. Um, but the, because of my love of records, I always used to like putting out separate singles. God, how did we do it? I mean, when I look back, the amount of work, that we did, and we put out all those albums, and it was just the love of records from the word go, and always been passionate for like putting different B sides on records. So, I think you, you must keep up, you must listen to records, and you must, you know, you must own up to the fact that if you're not selling records, you don't shut away and, and stop listening to everybody else. And there was a period of time that I did that. Okay, I mean, like, you, you, I mean, you say you, you, you're a fan of music, right? When I, um, and I mean, I've known you for a long time, but I, when I thought about having to do this interview, and I thought, my God, I mean, like, when I started looking back at all the resume of what you've done, the albums you've brought out, the success you've had, on just the record side, and then I thought about the Watford side and being chairman of Watford and just your acceptance everywhere, uh, and knowing that sometimes you have your depressions and you have your ups. Most of them have been, in, uh, the depression have been in, uh, through personal things, not through career things. Mm. I'm, I mean, I've known you ever since you started knitting that sweater, really. And um, that's a long time. And the, the depressions in my career have mostly been through personal things. Mm. I, have, I have had a personal life as well. Uh, God knows how, but I have. And those are the things that sort of, in mean, my career, I, I find it a game. I love it. It's a constant game and a battle, and I love it. But, I mean, the, the personal thing is much harder to cope with. Robert, I mean, like, even if you look at, say, like, what you were saying, we, we, you, we, people you were fans of, like, the Stones, the Beatles, whatever it may be, um, you became chairman of Watford. I mean, they were in the FA Cup. You took them to... Um, took them to Workington. ..number one division. Yeah. I mean, I mean they're, they're dreams, really. Yeah, they are. But, I mean... You can't enter anything in life if you... When I took over as chairman, I knew that it was a viable situation. It was not, not taking a, a club with a 12,000 capacity ground, you know. Right. It, it was viable, so I got the best people. And it, it was like my career. I've been surrounded by really good people who are still with me. And the football club is exactly the same. It's been fun. It's been disciplined. But you, in life, you can... Anybody who's got the ultimate uh, bit of talent, if they go for it, you know, they, anyone can right. go for broke and they can succeed. Ronald Reagan's president of America. Yeah, sure. I mean, like, but then I, I, I look at you at the Royal Wedding the other day, um, in the Abbey. Did you like the dress? I thought it was great, didn't you? It was fantastic. I, sequence took me ages. Renata stayed up all night sewing my sequence on it. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm.